the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So my family up in Vermont are uh, fascinated with puzzles, and on a cold, dreary day like today, that's exactly what they would be doing is uh, putting together a puzzle. Uh, but we're all over the gamut into what kind of puzzle uh, aficionado we are. I am uh, one of the simpler ones who likes big pieces, something that can be finished in an hour or two, uh, and I have no qualms about looking at the box the entire time. There are others who've been at it much longer who find the smallest pieces you can possibly find, uh, make it a week-long quest or several summer-long uh, quests sometimes, uh, and they have rules. You cannot look at the box. You cannot start with the border. Uh, but it does open up some incredible moments of epiphany when people realize that they've put something together, that they've connected a piece that connects this piece to this piece, and then they draw it together and they start to see the picture. And it's amazing when those moments happen where, where, where a piece here uh, put together connects with this set that someone else has been working on on the far side of the table, maybe for weeks, and when they start putting them all together, all of a sudden, this image, uh, it becomes clear. I think scripture's the same way. And I think we're called to be that meticulous about it, that when we start putting those pieces together, we don't necessarily find out what God wants us to do every minute of every day of, of our lives. We don't get easy answers to difficult questions, but we get an image of the person for whom we say we are when we walk out of here as the body of Christ. The self-revelation of the God in whose image we are made that we hear today. And when we put that together, the person of Jesus, who is the person of God, who is who we are called to, to be as a collective body and the image in which we were made, we know our marching order. But we have to know our God before we can know our marching orders. And we've spent a whole lot of time trying to uh, uh, help our children realize that, uh, that our Sunday school isn't enough. That uh, with the table talk questions and the other opportunities to really discuss what it is that we're learning story after story, week after week. It's incredible, but it starts somewhere else. You know where children learn how important scripture is? They learn by how important it is to their moms and dads, how important it is to their grandma and grandfather, how important it is uh, to the stalwarts in the church that they've seen week in and week out. How much does the story of God, learning more about who God is, matter to the people that we've looked up to since we were this big? If we want it to matter to our children, it's got to matter to us. And so we've got to put all of those puzzle pieces together and realize it's going to be muddy and difficult work. This is one of those muddy days metaphorically and otherwise. But I think when we do, we find a Jesus that is incredible, that stops us in our tracks, that we can't take our eyes off of. A, a Jesus, a God that we fall so madly in love with that we can't stand it. A God who angers us and disagrees with us and challenges us so we can't stand it. A God we cannot ignore. I think that's one of the things uh, Lynn talked uh, beautifully about, uh, about the Pope's visit uh, and one of the things that kept it in our forefront of our mind was this was somebody who was drawn to a life that was outside uh, any of the poles that we established that clearly was faithful to God. And the thing that was frustrating about the Pope, as soon as we thought he was on our side, he agreed with us on this issue and this issue and this issue, then all of a sudden he's over here on another issue. As soon as we think, this is our guy. He's, he's uh, uh, telling us to wake up to what we're doing to our earth. He's, he's, he's passionate about social justice. He's, he's challenging some of the norms in the church that have held for thousands of years. This is our man. Uh, then the other side is saying, man, this is our man. Uh, he's against these things. Uh, he's, uh, he's met with, with Kim Davis. He's definitely in our court. We find out that he also met in the same conversation with one of his students uh, and his same-sex partner. And we realize we can't put him in a box, but we can't ignore him because of the way he's living his life. Because he's faithful to something other than the camps we've put ourselves in. His heart is open, and he's been open to transformation. He challenges us. And I think I know where he learned it. I think he learned it from Jesus. And today's gospel is one of those moments. It's one of those puzzle pieces that you can't make the puzzle without because it's so many of the different things wound together. 
So what's happening in our story today? Uh, Jesus is walking and all of a sudden he's approached by the Pharisees who are trying to trap him uh, and get him to say something that would be unpopular with this sect or with this sect so at least they can divide his popularity. Uh, and they ask him about divorce. And he's not going to say the right answer. Uh, generally, the, uh, the whole uh, Jewish uh, faith is, is, is comfortable with the uh, ability to have divorces, uh, but they disagree on what the grounds are. Uh, does anybody know what actually uh, the legal grounds for a divorce were? Let me pull out my scroll. Uh, <laughs> According to Deuteronomy, which uh, uh, Jesus asked, so what does Moses have to say about it? And Moses says, you know, a man, uh, a, a man uh, can get a letter of dismissal uh, uh, for his wife. Uh, but the grounds, now these are, uh, these are pretty strict stipulations here. She does not please him. <laughs> because he finds something object objectionable about her. Now, uh, I know it's pretty thin, but uh, he does not please, she does not please him. Because he finds something objectionable about her. Uh, that was the grounds for divorce. So Jesus challenges us. Jesus challenges the norms of the time. He challenges what was actually written as the word of God. Because God isn't stagnant. God is moving and living. And he says, what does Moses say? And he says, that was because your hearts were hard. But Jesus also saw what was happening. Divorces were granted because women were unable to, uh, to produce children. The, uh, uh, the most uh, consequential purpose of your life at that point was to be able to have ancestors that outnumbered the stars. The more people you could put on this earth, the more substance you had. Uh, and if you couldn't produce children, it was the woman's fault. And the woman could be dismissed. Now, originally, that dismissal paper was, was meant as, as, as a little bit of protection for the woman. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, 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 there's so much shame in that culture that uh, uh, a parent, a father, had the right to stone his daughter to death if she was dismissed from her husband. Uh, but the certificate of divorce was, was somewhat of a thin layer of protection. It allowed her to remarry. It was possible for her to remarry, but that seldom happened. Uh, and uh, Mark's the only gospel that actually uh, acknowledges that, that women could get divorces, but that was incredibly rare. Uh, and generally, very few women had the capacity to be able to get permission and then also to be able to, to live afterwards. Because what happened to a, a woman who was dismissed, even with that certificate, if her parents, who were depending on her, uh, at least her husband, for, uh, for income uh, in their retirement, uh, took her home, uh, they were still somewhat vulnerable. Uh, often they wouldn't, and then you're left with a life of prostitution. So this covenant that they've entered into has been broken because uh, the woman has not produced the, the, the children, uh, and therefore this letter of dismissal is, is granted. And Jesus says, is that really what marriage is all about? Is that really why we, you were made male and female in God's image? So there's a beautiful collect. There's a beautiful collect uh, for a particular Sunday that says that we're supposed to take Scripture. We're supposed to open it, we're supposed to read it, we're supposed to learn it, we're supposed to mark it, we're supposed to inwardly digest it. So I had a pastor who grabbed the bulletin uh, and to show the children how seriously they took it, he started to eat the gospel as it was printed in the bulletin uh, just to give them a sense of how important scripture is. So as Jesus refers to scripture again, uh, he calls them to understand what it is to live into that covenant. And he goes and he does something interesting. He says, essentially, why are we made? Why do we have marriage in the first place? Let's go back to Genesis, which was a logical thing to do. He used scripture. He goes to first Genesis, first chapter of Genesis. And he says to them what they already knew. We're made in the image of God. We are made female and male, male and female in the image of God. And then as he goes on to say the next verse, the next verse is, uh, so be fruitful and multiply, just like all the other animals. But he doesn't. He skips that verse, and he goes all the way to the second chapter of Genesis. Now, does Jesus get mixed up in his chapters? Probably not. But he goes from that image all the way to the second chapter, where he says, it is not good for man to be alone, and that two become one. And you see, that's radical. The purpose of marriage before then uh, was progeny. The purpose of marriage was to be able to create as many children as you could. And Jesus is saying, no, the reason that we were made male and female in God's image 
was because we're made to be in relationship. We're made to have people that care about us, to be in some intimate relationship connected to one another. Whether through marriage or otherwise, we're made to be in relationship. That's why we gather at the altar as the body of Christ, why we break bread together, why we notice when you're not there on Sunday and we come and we visit you, because we are made for relationship. And that's the focus of marriage. And if you think he just got confused and picked the wrong chapter, his next thing is like, it, it, it even cements it further. He says, so if you have gotten a divorce and you remarry, you're committing adultery. The purpose of remarrying is that you have another chance to be able to, uh, uh, to spread your uh, seed uh, and, and, and procreate and, and, and be able to, uh, to increase your population and, and, and uh, fulfill what originally the thought of marriage was. But that's not the heart of marriage. It's to be in relationship. So when you look at the scripture and you pull out your highlighter, you, you go there and you read the scripture and you take a quick glance and you highlight uh, uh, man and woman intended for marriage. You highlight uh, the abomination of divorce. But then you also have to, have to compare that with the intent of relationship, with that marriage is meant to be people in relationship with one another, taking care of one another, making sure that they're in covenant with one another, holding true to those promises they make to one another. And you look at divorce, but you also have to acknowledge uh, that the same Jesus that continues to find unjust systems, to find the most vulnerable in society and systems, especially within the church, uh, that exploit those vulnerabilities and turn them upside down, is the same Jesus we see today. So yes, I think it's about the sanctity of marriage. I think it's about the depth of covenant that we make, uh, and that if we take that lightly, uh, we, we fail to understand the covenant that God makes within, with us and the depth of God's love and commitment to us, even when we, even when we stray. Uh, but I also think it's broader than that. I think it's that we are called to be in relationship with one another. We are called to make sure that nobody is left uncared for and vulnerable. And it takes several layers of digging into Scripture to get to that place. But I think that's what we're called to do, to paint the picture, to put the pieces together so that we understand that picture of Jesus. It doesn't necessarily answer definitively uh, questions about gay marriage or definitively questions about divorce or any of these other uh, hot button issues, uh, nor do we have to agree on it. But we have to realize that we're gathered around that same image, the image of God, the body of Christ. When we come and we break bread together, when we open our hearts, when we take our poles and we shatter them so that we come closer together. We understand the heart of God. And I think we understand where the Pope uh, and such fanatics like Jesus come from who challenge us in both directions. Because in the end, we're called to be united. We're called to be one. Amen. stand and face the cross as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and 